And last week, Congress impeached President Donald Trump on what was essentially a party line vote. He's just the third president in U.S. history to be impeached, but his supporters and closest allies are not down about these developments. In fact, they say they're more energized than before. Joining us this morning is the man who helped launch President Trump on his path to power, Corey Lewandowski. Thanks for having me back. Thank you, Corey. Thanks for being here. One of the most glaring strategic lessons from 2015 and 2016 is when anyone decides to take on President or Donald Trump directly in a direct frontal assault politically, their poll numbers start to plummet and they're wrecked, essentially, and from a political standpoint. Is that what we're seeing happen politically to the Democrats in Congress right now? Yeah, Donald Trump is the greatest counterpuncher ever in modern political history. And so what we've seen is in the battleground states, specifically amongst independents, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, places where are their essential places for Donald Trump to win. His numbers are better today than they were a month ago. And by and large, the reason for that is in those congressional districts that Donald Trump won that are now represented by Democrats, New Hampshire won being one of them, the outpouring of support by those independents that's saying, this impeachment was a total sham, is huge. Last week, we raised $10 million. The day of the impeachment, we raised $5 million, which means people are voting with their pocketbooks. That's a very strong message for those Democrats in those congressional districts who voted almost on a party line vote to impeach the president. The politics are one thing. What about the underlying conduct, though? I want to read you something from uh, this editorial in Christianity Today that came out uh, during the week. Uh, the president of the United States attempted to use his political power to coerce a foreign leader uh, to harass and discredit one of the president's political opponents. That is not only a violation of the Constitution, more importantly, it's profoundly immoral. Well, look, the truth is there are two people on the call who both said that there was nothing that went wrong. And either we can take uh, the president of the Ukraine's message for verbatim, which is what he said. He never felt any pressure. And we've also heard it. We've also read the transcripts. The president had no personal benefit to this. And let's just be clear for one minute. What the president has provided to the Ukraine, the military assistance that he's provided, is 10 times what Barack Obama did. And moreover, as you remember, at the end of November, the Congress had to operate on what's called the continuing resolution because they couldn't get a budget done. If they would have passed that budget, there would have been more money for Ukraine's uh, security as it relates to their attacks from Russia than if they didn't. So maybe Nancy Pelosi or the Democrats were the one who were holding up the funding and the continuing resolution that finally has now moved forward. So if the underlying conduct involved here is essentially okay, that phone call, which is you know under debate, that's what this is all about. Say if somebody like Jean Shaheen from the Foreign Relations Committee starts making phone calls in the U.S. Senate race to foreign leaders saying, hey, I want you to take a look into, or I suggest that you perhaps should look into Corey Lewandowski's business dealings. That's fair game? Look, I, I think what we have to do is we have to be very careful here. We've opened Pandora's box. We've said we want to know that every conversation that the President of the United States has with another world leader is now going to become public. If that's the case, we need to go back and look at how $400 million in cash was put on pallets and flown to Iraq. We have to understand what those conversations, was there a quid pro quo there? Are we real, did, does the American public really have the right to listen to every conversation between the President of the United States, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat, and every other world leader. Because if that's what we're talking about, that's a very different metric that's been ever been used against any other president. So I think those individuals, the leaders of the respective countries, should have the right to have private conversations and have honest conversations about what our relationship is going to be with those respective countries. We know the president loves a good fight. Uh, so do you. Uh, and so the question now is, as we move forward from this, uh, are you going to be taking on Gene Shaheen in 2020 uh, and entering this Republican primary for U.S. Senate? Well, I'm going to make that decision here in the next week. And I think what's been very clear is that the American people have been against this partisan witch hunt as it relates to the impeachment. Gene Shaheen has to remember that Donald Trump barely lost New Hampshire in 2016 in the general election, he's going to win it in 2020. And if she's going to vote to remove a duly elected individual as President of the United States that 63 million people voted for, there had better be more evidence than what was presented in the House trial. Because obstruction of Congress, while a serious charge, does not rise to the level of high crimes and misdemeanors. Look, when Richard Nixon was potentially going to be impeached, there was an underlying crime. There was a break in at Watergate. When Bill Clinton was impeached, that was because of perjury, lying under oath, and ultimately being disbarred. The president has not been charged with any crime. This is a partisan witch hunt. And what the American people also know is that three Democrats voted against the impeachment of this president. So Gene Shaheen 
and Maggie Hassan have to be very, very careful if they're going to fall in lockstep with AOC and Rashid Tlaib in the far left of the Democratic Party by voting to remove Donald Trump from office. As far as getting into the race, what makes the decision for you, though? I mean, we know you'd love to help President Trump in any capacity, but what about Corey Lewandowski? How do you make this decision? So part of it is I've been very clear. My family is the first priority for me. I've got young family. I want to make sure I can spend time with them. We've talked about this a lot now. Uh, I was in Washington last week with the president, both Friday of last week and then Monday of this week, talking again. I've talked with Senate leadership about this race to understand the resources that would be available to take on a two-term incumbent U.S. senator. Looked at her voting record, realized that she no longer aligned with the values of New Hampshire. All of these things are pointing us in the right direction. So making sure that, A, I have the financial resources, my family is uh, behind me 100%, which they are, and it's the best way for me to help the president be reelected uh, as the chief executive of our country. Look, all of these factors are pointing me in one direction. That direction, if I had to make the decision today, is to run. Jean Shaheen's not an easy candidate. Her family's gotten very rich while she's been in office. She's, she's really a, uh, a ghost in Washington, D.C. She's never passed a signature piece of legislation. She voted for sanctuary cities, uh, which don't align with New Hampshire values. So there is clear distinctions, particularly if she's going to vote to impeach this president of the United States. That's going to be a determining factor. That's going to happen after the first of the year. My decision will come before that. If you decide to run, are we going to see you make a full disclosure of all your business clients, all your ties that you've been working on in Washington? Happy to. Look, I, look I, have, I have nothing to hide here. I've never worked for a foreign government, a foreign client, a foreign anything. I've never taken money from a foreign institution or a foreign bank of any nature. So all of my business that I've had the opportunity and the privilege to do over the last three years have been from U.S. entities. And look, there's nothing wrong with that. That's how I've made a living. I'm not a lobbyist. I don't, I've never lobbied anybody. I've never contacted someone in the federal government asking them to do something for a potential client ever. It's never happened. So, you know, me giving strategic advice and counsel to companies who are doing business with the government, never making a phone call to those government officials to ask for anything, uh, is perfectly legal, and I'm happy to disclose that information. You've never asked President Trump to help with this Never. Or that? Never. Hmm. We've seen some reporting that says you could be joining the re-election team for Benjamin Netanyahu. Any truth to that? And is that, how does that factor in, I guess, also to the idea of, you know, say if I'm Joe Voter in Farmington, New Hampshire, if I read somehow, if I'm sitting there reading Politico, as I'm stretching this out here, if I'm a Farmington guy sitting there reading this story, how do I know that Corey Lewandowski cares more about me than he does about, say, helping get... Benjamin Dutton, not Yahoo reelected. Well, look, I live in New Hampshire. I've lived in New Hampshire my entire adult life. My children go to school here in the public schools. We've made our life here in New Hampshire. And everything that I have done has been to keep my life in New Hampshire. And, and look, when I joined the Trump campaign, I could have packed up my family and moved to New York or Washington, D.C. These are the values that we hold dear, uh, the New Hampshire values, the smaller government, lower taxes, less regulation. But I did go to Israel, and I spoke with Netanyahu. He is probably if not our best friend in the world from a, a U.S. government perspective, his race is critical. And I haven't made a decision if I'm going to go help uh, uh, pr President, uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu run for re-election. That's a decision that he has to make. But I do understand the strategic importance of having a strong, tough ally in the Middle East to make sure that U.S. interests are preserved there. And I think it's fair to say Benjamin Netanyahu is probably the United States' best friend in the Middle East, if not the world. Can I have you put your campaign manager hat back on for a second here? Uh, we kind of know what President Trump will likely do if the nominee is, say, a Sanders, a Warren, a Biden. What if it's Pete Buttigieg? How does President Trump approach someone who has no ties to Washington? Well, look, you know, th that's the message that we ran on, right? The outsider. The, and, and by the way, Donald Trump has been a transformational president coming to Washington, D.C., kicking aside 30 years of Republican dogma of how things have always been done. I think it's somewhat attractive for a Pete Buttigieg running as an outsider with no Washington, D.C. experience to say, look, Washington is fundamentally broken. We've got five, I think, Democrat U.S. senators who are running for president of the United States on a list of accomplishments which don't exist in the U.S. Senate. So taking that message of not being required to be the insider in Washington to Pete Buttigieg is a strong message for Pete. And I think what you see is a clear difference. Does Pete Buttigieg have the credentials and the tenacity to fight world leaders on the stage and call them out when the United States is not being treated fairly, whether that's increased uh, contributions to NATO, this, this president has done both to our allies and our adversaries, saying you have to pay more, we're not going to be America, we're not going to be the piggy bank of the world. You have to have someone who instills fear and, more importantly, respect in those world leaders. And the question is, does Pete have the ability to do that?
All right, Corey Lewandowski, thanks for joining us on Close Up. My pleasure. We await that uh, Senate decision in the coming week. Thank you. Appreciate it.